Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We trust all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving Day weekend. We're now back in the saddle with good, bad, and crazy martinis, and we're also here to tell you today that the Three Martini Lunch today is sponsored by Patriot Mobile, and more on them in just a moment. Jim, let's start with the good news. Some might find this uh, a little bit uh, crass, but longtime listeners of the Three Martini Lunch will know that we do not have any problem celebrating when people who have crushed the hopes, dreams, and rights of otherwise people yearning to breathe free breathe their last. We did it with Hugo Chavez. We did it with Muammar Gaddafi, even though that was under certainly less than ideal circumstances. Did it with Kim Jong-il. Fidel Castro is dead. He's been out of power officially for a few years, and his brother Raul has been running the show. Uh, Sadly, we've essentially normalized relations with them, and we'll get to that in a little bit in our second martini, which also deals with this. But Fidel Castro is dead, and there's a lot of things that you can say as to why it's a good thing that he's gone. I could come up with several about uh, crushing rights and uh, leading to the greatest nuclear threat uh, possibly since the actual use of atomic weapons at the end of World War II. But instead of me uh, giving my thoughts on this, I'm going to let a lady who was partying up the night in Little Havana, Cuba, explain why she's so happy. We're celebrating um, the end of a man who separated so many families throughout the years, a man who killed many, who imprisoned many individuals just for thinking differently and not believing in his revolution, like my father, who was a political prisoner in Cuba for many years. I didn't get to live uh, my, my early years, my childhood with my father because of Fidel Castro and his regime. Therefore, I am glad. I am glad that he's gone. I'm just sorry that he's gone before he's able to see a free Cuba because Cuba's going to be free and I think that would have been the ultimate slap in the face for him to have been alive with a free Cuba. Castro promised freedom from the uh, very corrupt uh, Batista regime which was corrupt. He did not follow through on that. He embraced communism. People's hopes, dreams and rights were crushed. Jim, I have no problem saying it. I'm glad he's gone. When I tweeted out a picture someone had put together of a skeleton with the, uh, the trademark Fidel Castro beard, cigar, and military uniform, just two little facts about Castro that really got airbrushed out of history. The first comes from a letter that Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev sent to Castro after the Cuban Missile Crisis. It begins as thus, and this really should grab people's attention. Quote, In your cable of October 27th, this is 1962, you propose that we be the first to carry out a nuclear strike against the enemy's territory. Naturally, you understand where that would lead us. It would not be a simple strike, but the start of a thermonuclear world war. Dear Comrade Fidel Castro, I find your proposal to be wrong, even though I understand your reasons. We have lived through a very grave moment. A global thermonuclear could have broken out. Uh, Of course, the United States would have suffered enormous losses, but the Soviet Union and the whole socialist bloc would have also suffered greatly. Let's not forget, in addition to all of his other crimes, Fidel Castro was calling for nuclear strikes on the United States. And not just simply like saying in public we should do this, writing to the Soviet leaders and saying, please nuke America. Even if we get wiped out by the fallout, it is worthwhile to build the the global socialist workers paradise, etc., etc. I'm trying to think of many more evil things you could do. (laughs) That really is very high up there, but maybe number two does it. Uh, From from fairly early in his term to 1998, do you know what else Castro did, Greg? He banned Christmas. He's literally the Grinch who stole Christmas. Um, And so the idea that that there's something, you know, at this time we should feel sad for him or sad for all of his supporters who are sorry to see him go, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I have no sympathy for this man. I have no pity for this man. He inflicted untold suffering upon millions of people. Um, A cruel, barbaric man who uh, uh, deserves to be tossed onto the ash heap of history. Uh, And if he's going to be remembered, remembered only for his crimes. So um, good riddance, Fidel. Uh, I hope you find it warm where you are. I'm not particularly surprised if that's the case. The longtime listeners will will remember that you have a uh, rather unique poster. Does this mean that uh, everyone on that poster is now gone? Uh, Amongst the bad guys, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so this is the Bedtime for Brezhnev uh, fictional movie poster. It came out in 1981. 
Uh, it pictures uh, kind of a Western with, you know, Ronald Reagan as the good guy and, and Brezhnev as the bad guy. So Leonid Brezhnev is the main bad guy, and the other two members of his gang are Muammar Gaddafi and Fidel Castro. Uh, Fidel Castro looks kind of like uh, Pancho Villa on that. And I'm sure Mexicans and Cubans will be irked to be compared. But nonetheless, uh, oh, I guess you could also say that Jerry Brown is in there as the preacher, <laughs> Um, which I always struck me as the guy who's urging no gunplay, no gunfights, uh, and not really recognizing the the evil that uh, the bad guys represent. The good guys are represented by uh, obviously Ronald Reagan, uh, co-starring Nancy Davis, Nancy Reagan, both of whom passed away. General Alexander Haig, but two of the good guys are still with us: uh, the Honorable George Bush, referring to George H. W. Bush, uh, who looks an awful lot like his son in uh, in the illustration, and Henry Kissinger as Doc. Uh, in that one. So, yeah, but yes, I, I've looked at this poster on my wall for a long time and wondered when uh, the last one was going to kick the bucket. Here we are, and I think the world is better off for their departure. Definitely agree with that. All right, let's move on to the second martini and the bad martini. And, Jim, this doesn't come as a huge surprise to us, but the way that leftist politicians here and abroad have effectively reacted to this is truly truly depressing. First came uh, President Obama's statement, quote, at this time of Fidel Castro's passing, we extend a hand of friendship to the Cuban people. We know that this moment fills Cubans in Cuba and in the United States with powerful emotions, recalling the countless ways in which Fidel Castro altered the course of individual lives, families, and of the Cuban nation. History will record and judge the enormous impact of this singular figure on the people and world around him. The next paragraph naturally is all about Obama and his policy towards Cuba, and then he goes on to offer condolences to Fidel Castro's family. In contrast, Donald Trump's statement says, Today the world marks the passing of a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people for nearly six decades. Fidel Castro's legacy is one of firing squads, theft, unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. While Cuba remains a totalitarian island, it is my hope that today marks a move away from the horrors endured for too long and toward a future in which the wonderful Cuban people finally live in the freedom they so richly deserve. He says, though the tragedies, deaths, and pain caused by Fidel Castro cannot be erased, our administration will do all it can to ensure the Cuban people can finally begin their journey toward prosperity and liberty. Oh, there's so much more. Where to go? Uh, how about uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister of Canada? He makes Obama look like a hardliner here. It is with deep sorrow that I learned today of the death of Cuba's longest-serving president. Fidel Castro was a larger-than-life leader who served his people for almost half a century, a legendary revolutionary and orator. Mr. Castro made significant improvements to the education and health care of his island nation. While a controversial figure, both Mr. Castro's supporters and detractors recognized his tremendous dedication and love for the Cuban people who had a deep and lasting affection for El Comandante. Now we've got the New York Times and the Washington Post. The New York Times headline, a revolutionary who defied the U.S. and held Cuba in his thrall. Washington Post, original headline, revolutionary remade Cuba. About as sanitized as you can get. The Sunday morning shows were also filled with these sorts of people who were talking about what wonderful education and health care opportunities there were in Cuba. And that's also what Dana Bash tried to impress upon Florida Senator Marco Rubio, who was having none of it. She even tried to throw the fact that the Pope sent condolences uh, to the family of Fidel Castro. And Rubio was not going to be okay with that statement, and he's certainly not okay with Obama's statement, which he called pathetic. Here's Rubio. Well, as a practicing Catholic, I believe in the theological authority of uh, the Bishop of Rome, uh, and, and that's what Pope Francis is. On political matters, however, particularly on foreign policy issues, I don't necessarily believe that that binds uh, those of us in the faith in terms of issues of foreign policy. I still respect it, but that's a very different thing. Pope Francis is the leader of a religious uh, organization, the Roman Catholic Church. Barack Obama is the president of the most powerful country in the world. And what I call pathetic is not mentioning whatsoever in that statement the reality that there are thousands upon thousands of people who suffered brutally under the Castro regime. He executed people. He jailed people for 20 to 30 years. The Florida Straits, there are thousands of people who lost their lives fleeing his dictatorship. And not to acknowledge any of that in the statement, I felt is pathetic. Absolutely. Jim, like I said at the start of this, Martini, not surprising, but the left's continued fawning over Castro and the whitewashing of the record is completely nauseating. Greg, is it the soft bigotry of low expectations when I read the Obama statement and said, ah, oh, it's a lot of, it's really self-absorbed. He's talking about himself a lot. Um, that's pretty pleasing. <laughs> 
And I say that because I'd rather have Obama talking about how great he is and how great his record is, even though it isn't, than to be talking about how great Castro's record is. And you could tell, you know, he, he affected millions of lives, you know, thousands of lives in Cuba. Yes, by killing them. <laughs> that will definitely affect someone's life. Obama's was pretty bad. Uh, Trudeau's was probably the most egregious. Quite a few coming in from across Europe. Greg, got to give credit where it's due. The most accurate and I felt appropriate statement came from Donald Trump, the president-elect of the United States. <laughs> He's growing on me. He really, you know... Um, what, what really struck me was not the, if you want to say, oh, he inspired people across Central America and South America, okay, fine. If you want to say he was a symbol of standing up against Yankee, you can say all that. But let's not deny this man ran death squads. Let's not deny this guy jailed any political opponent he could, that there is no freedom of speech uh, in Cuba, no freedom of assembly, that all this, this terrific, oh, Cuba has a high literacy rate. Well, great. If you don't have freedom to read what you want to read, what good does it do you, right? What, you know, if all you can read is, is, is the regime's propaganda, what's the point of all that literacy? Oh, it's got great health care. Yeah, if you're one of the connected people. It was not the, uh, the buying into the glamour that bothered me so much as the deliberate aversion of the eyes from the real record of Castro and the determination that everyone's going to talk about his style and his cigars and the icon that he was, et cetera, et cetera, and averting their eyes from that. And I also kept, you know, people were saying, oh, he outlasted all those presidents. Yes, because they never had any free elections. <laughs> if Eisenhower banned elections, you know, he might have been able to last that long, too. <laughs> Jim, I, I think Newt said it. I think a couple other people have said it, uh, given all the laudatory statements and, and uh, coverage in the press in the past couple of days. If you can't get the basic facts and the basic take on Fidel Castro right, maybe it's time for you to not be uh, advising people what should be the next step on a variety of issues for the United States. It almost reminds me of your uh, warning to people who voted for John Edwards at some point. That if you really thought, you know, Fidel Castro was a good guy who really had everybody's best interest at heart and maybe just got a little carried away with the death squads and the executions <laughs> and the prison of political prisoners and shutting down any critics and things like that. Uh, no, and shooting down planes and, and his, you know, the, the roof. Oh, uh, it's worth noting also, in addition to all the other crimes of the regime, um, we try to think of it as this, you know, uh, quaint little island with 1950s cars and uh, a thriving child prostitution business. Um, no, actually, in addition to all that, Cuba's intelli uh, intelligence services, they spy on the exiles in Miami and at the United States at way well above their weight. Uh, this is a regime that really knows how to spy on people, has no concerns about uh, uh, international law and shooting down planes and things like that. So uh, let's not, you know, let's look at the totality of the Cuban regime's record when we do these, have these kinds of discussions. And uh, it was absolutely stomach turning to watch so many world leaders decide they just weren't going to talk about that because it would be rude to bring that up upon Castro's death. We have no problem bringing that up. That's why we're here at the three yes, there we go. We're, we are the skunks at the garden party funeral. <laughs> Man, the left will cozy up to just about anybody. And uh, they're also uh, in, intertwined with uh, somebody you might be doing business with. Would you switch phone companies if you knew your current carrier was using your money to push leftist causes, whether it's restricting Second Amendment rights, uh, promoting abortion for Planned Parenthood? What if there was a liberal phone company targeting conservative candidates and organizations? Would you want to switch to one that has more of a conservative perspective? Well, the fact is your current phone carrier may be using your money to donate to causes you don't believe in. There's also uh, one company that's spending tens of millions of dollars to defeat conservative leaders and fight for liberal social change. Well, Patriot Mobile decided to take action. Patriot Mobile offers nationwide talk and text and high-speed data at competitive prices and donates up to 5% of your monthly bill to the conservative organization of your choice. You get the same quality service, the latest and greatest devices, including Apple 6 and Galaxy S7, for example, competitive prices, and center-right causes that you believe in. Finally, a mobile phone company that believes what you believe. Patriot Mobile is America's only conservative phone company and was created to fight for conservative causes and defend conservative candidates. So don't let the left and their allies in the industry of uh, mobile phones defeat the conservative leaders. Stand with Patriot Mobile and give voice to your conservative values with every call, every text, and every status update. Patriot Mobile, the conservative choice for mobile phone service. Join the conversation. Call one 800 
a patriot or patriotmobile.com slash ricochet. Three Martini Lunch is brought to you by Patriot Mobile, so make your cell phone company as conservative as you are. That's 1-800-APATRIOT or patriotmobile.com slash ricochet. All right, Jim, on to the crazy martini now. And just when we thought that uh, the Clintons were going away, she's back, but kind of in at least on the surface, uh, just as a kind of a party adding on to Jill Stein's nonsense here. Most folks are, I think, aware of what's going on here. But here's the New York Times story. Nearly three weeks after Election Day, Hillary Clinton's campaign said on Saturday that it would participate in a recount process in Wisconsin, incited by a third-party candidate, and would join any potential recounts in two other closely contested states, Pennsylvania and Michigan. The Clinton campaign held out little hope of success in any of these three states and said it had seen no actionable evidence of vote hacking that might taint the results or otherwise provide new grounds for challenging Donald J. Trump's victory. But it suggested it was going along with the recount effort to assure supporters that it was doing everything possible to verify that hacking by Russia or other irregularities had not affected the results. Donald Trump, of course, not going to take this lying down, tweeting several times. First, the Green Party scam to fill up their coffers by asking for impossible recounts is now being joined by the badly defeated and demoralized Dems. Another one. The Democrats, when they incorrectly thought they were going to win, asked that the election night tabulation be accepted. Not so anymore. Then he goes into what Hillary said during the debate about how horrible it was that he would wait and see about the election results. And then her comments uh, the day after the election about how Donald Trump would be the next president. Then he says, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. Another one. It would have been much easier for me to win the so-called popular vote than the Electoral College in that I would only campaign in three or four states instead of the 15 states that I visited. I would have won even more easily and convincingly. But smaller states are forgotten. Serious voter fraud in Virginia, New Hampshire, and California. So why isn't the media reporting on this? Serious bias. Big problem. So, Jim, let's uh, go through the the list here. There's a lot to unpack there. (laughs) Jill Stein has no chance of winning. I'm not sure why she's doing this unless she's just getting a whole ton of heat from Democrats for perhaps costing Hillary the race in a couple of these states. Uh, you, you've got Hillary, who is now going to have the sore loser status. If they actually conjure up tens of thousands of votes in these states to flip any of them, we're going to have zero confidence in the system. And instead of just letting the crazies play it out, Trump has to hop on Twitter and not only uh, attack what's going on here, but then throw out uh, rigged election allegations of his own in states that he narrowly lost. So what do you make of it? Yeah, let's get the obvious joke out of the way. So Trump is now complaining about a rigged election in a race that he won. (laughs) Um, So beginning here, so Jill Stein, I I think it's a much simpler explanation here. One is that Jill Stein, for all of her wackiness, all of her cuckoo beliefs that wireless signals are affecting children's brains and that by listening to this podcast, you're doing, you know, you're suffering brain damage. I'm sure I'm sure critics of this podcast would probably say, yes, it counts as that. (laughs) She has all these crazy beliefs, but she figured out there are a lot of Democrats who are still angry about the election, still in denial about the election, still going through the the five cooler Ross stages. Um, And she basically, if you can offer people the hope that we're going to undo Election Day, they will eagerly open up their wallets. And last I checked, she had raised about $6.2 million for for her effort to, like Greg, check the fine print, demand a request for a recount. (laughs) (laughs) She has no authority. She can put up the money for one in the state of Wisconsin, but the margin there is well beyond ten thousand. It's, it's I believe it's like twenty one thousand. Um, you're not going to find twenty one thousand new Hillary votes. Not even Al Franken's uh, trunk of his car has that many votes. <laughs> the Democrats can just oh oh look well, we found some oh these just must not have, must have forgotten to count these you know type scenarios. Um, we have seen recounts where the numbers change by a couple hundred. You're not going to see it by 10, by 10,000, which I believe is the margin in Michigan, 21,000, which is the margin in Wisconsin, and 68,000 in the margin of Pennsylvania. Um, so Jill, what is Jill Stein doing here? Well, she's doing something which is raising an enormous amount of money for her. Uh, what is Hillary Clinton doing? My guess is Hillary Clinton thought that if she said, no, there's really no point to this effort, you're not going to make up this margin Trump won fair and square, then she would be seen as a quitter. She would be seen as somebody who wasn't willing to fight to the end and all that. And so my guess is that they decided, she decided, okay, I better, I better sign on to this. Um, and there's some people who think that by, by making this argument, 
uh, you will kind of delegitimize um, uh, Donald Trump. I, I have my doubts about anybody who can do math would figure out that no, you're not going to find uh, oodles and oodles of, of votes anywhere. But for some reason, um, this is uh, something that seems to uh, please uh, folks on the left. This seems to give them their, their, their hearts beat a little bit quicker at the thought, oh, maybe we're going to find this giant supply of votes and uh, uh, this will, you know, undo the election and, and all that stuff. Never mind that, you know, Hillary has conceded the Electoral College votes uh, meets on, I believe, December 19th, I want to say, somewhere around there. Um, there was one theory that if you could keep the argument about the recounts going, then certain states would not, you know, the, the electors wouldn't vote. I don't think that's very likely to happen. Uh, but the idea is that then you wouldn't have Trump reach 270 electoral votes, and then the House would have to do it, and that would further delegitimize himself. Look, Hillary, Jill Stein, Democrats, stop trying to delegitimize Donald Trump and the idea of him being a, a, the authentic, real president of the United States. That's his job, okay? He's going to do that himself with crazy tweets like this, <laughs> claiming for millions of votes. Because, and I wrote about this in the morning, Jill, by, you know, look, there, is it possible that there are fraudulent votes cast or people who are not registered voters did cast ballots? Yeah, yeah. In fact, there are. In fact, I'd say it's almost certain that it happened. Did it happen in a margin to to swing a vote, uh, to swing an election? Well, you're not going to find ten thousand, twenty one thousand, or sixty eight thousand in any of those three big states. He mentioned Virginia as one of the states he was concerned about. Uh, I wrote about this. A good Virginia politics blog called Bearing Drift looked at this. Um, we're talking about what what, it, what they did find was they found people who are, were registered to vote who had said that they were not. Uh, U.S. citizens on other documents. Now, maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they made a mistake when they said they weren't because they didn't want to get called for jury duty. Maybe they really aren't U.S. citizens. You know, at this point, should the uh, should the people the the uh, board of elections people review those records? Absolutely. Is it possible some of them are fraudulently trying to vote? Sure. But let's remember, in Virginia, they have photo ID, meaning you have to have some sort of state issued photo ID saying you're you're a U.S. citizen and you're registered to you you live at that actual location in order to commit successful voter fraud. So, you know, is it possible there were a couple of votes cast that were cast by illegals? Yes. Should they be prosecuted? Absolutely. Does this mean that the 5% margin for Hillary Clinton in the state of uh, Virginia was that? No. No, it was not. In fact, I actually got to go through the numbers. I think it was in the neighborhood of like 200,000 votes. So, no, Virginia was not stolen from Donald Trump. So here he has the, the, uh, the moral high ground. The Democrats are acting ridiculous. And naturally, he had to find some way to... Uh, so way to step in it uh, and make some completely outlandish claim that everyone will be able to make fun of instead of paying attention to uh, uh, you know, the actual legitimacy argument, which is that the Democrats are basically going – that Jill Stein is basically bilking an enormous amount of money from liberals who are in absolute denial about the election results. They just won't go away, but uh, hopefully they will soon. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And remember the great deal from Patriot Mobile. They offer nationwide talk and text and high-speed data, competitive prices, and donates up to 5% of your monthly bill to the conservative organization of your choice. Dial 1-800-APATRIOT or go to patriotmobile.com slash ricochet. Join us again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.